So, Georg Arne Clavert is has a background in computer science and computational biology. He was senior scientist at the Harkreiter Lab and Institute of Bioinformatics at Johannes Kepler University from 2007 to 2015. He spent the following several years at Bayer where he ultimately became director, head of machine learning research. In 2022, he accepted a role, a global role as VP, head of machine learning research at Pfizer Research. His research efforts initially focused on microarray data and later shifted to the prediction of the biological effects of compounds using methods such as deep learning, uh, uh, deep neural networks. In machine learning, notably, he introduced the use of exponential linear units, or ELUs, which has become a de facto standard in the field of deep learning. And with that, I want to turn it over to you. Thank you. Oh, oh. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh yeah, thank you very much for having me. I'm very interesting where you get the CV. I, <laughs> um, okay, um, yeah, you know, it it's probably is like something like um, 15 years ago, I was in a conference in ISMB, I was a PhD student at the time, I was passed there around the, around the broad institute and I said like, ah, one day I maybe want to also at least enter this hall here. And now I have the pleasure to talk here. So therefore, thank you very much for this nice invitation. So. Um, I will talk about harnessing drug discovery um, from um, property prediction up to molecular de novo design. And you know, without further ado, let's jump to it. So I have to set the scene a little bit. You mentioned it before. So I was um, appointed as director of machine learning research at Bayer um, until two, from 2019 until October last year. So during that time, I had built up a very fantastic group, really nice people. But um, at a certain point, it was time to move, take the next step. I had the opportunity to build up machine learning research um, 2.0 at Pfizer. So, uh, you know, I stayed with a couple of good guys that I had very wonderful experience. So, but nonetheless, so lots of the work that I'm presenting to go um, is like really, I have to admit, is like from a fantastic former group at Bayer. Mm -hmm. So, um, when I pitched machine learning research to my higher management, it was always that I claimed it's super important for us for the drug discovery processes to develop, to develop intelligent systems that allows us to transport or like to um, an input that is typically very easy to obtain into something that is a higher good, so that is typically very talk, um, very expensive. So the outcome of an assay, so toxicity measurement or binding of a certain compound. So something that is Quite unique also for our group is it like um, we are involved in several European Union projects. So we have PhD students in our group that are fully funded by the European Union. We also write our source code with love. So we make everything public available. Every code, every message that we have developed is on GitHub. You can pick it there up. And if it's possible with pre trained networks, everything is there. And also, we have a quite, a quite a high scientific output, not only in just typical computational biology journals, but also like in NeurIPS, ICML, iClear. Um, so that's something. So, so we also try quite active in this field. Um, maybe setting the stage. So um, drug development, drug discovery, drug development is super important, but. Um, I will not talk about that. So I stay where I work, where the data is. So, uh, and that is something where we probably have most of the data in the early drug discovery. So that we have the output of those super large high, high content screens, high throughput screens, bioactivity screens, and that is fun to work. And there we can also um, use our models and bring certain value at least to the company. Mm -hmm. um, so when people are talking about machine learning in the drug discovery context, like the, the prime example is always like, yeah, you can use it and predict the bioactivity of a compound and then we can make compounds much faster and easier. Yeah, these great ideas are super old. I mean, since the 60s, people are trying to do that. Um, yes, and they have improved a lot, but nonetheless, this quantitative structure activity relationship modeling is still um, far from being perfect. Even so, it still is a working house in pharmaceutical industry. Mm -hmm. So, and the problem there is it that we have models of our, our molecules, what they are. And um, as all models, they are probably not so good. At least it's clear for that one that this is not a molecule. 
So that's a question like how we are thinking as a human of the molecule. And there we have like simple line notations, like a, a formula, molecular formula. We have the molecular graph or the smiles that is describing exactly the same molecule. It exactly has the same information content. Mm -hmm. Or we go and can take more com complex uh, um, uh, representation like the 3D conformation of a molecule or the electron density. But that is still like the way how humans think about it. And that's a little bit different like how we have to um, transport it or to make it that a, a computer can use it as an input. So in the case of a molecular formula, it is something like a hot one encoding. Mm -hmm. um, for the smiles, basically the same. If you want to represent it as a, as a graph, you need the node matrix and the adjacency matrix, which gives you the information like which nodes in this graph are connected and maybe how strong they are connected or what kind of bond type it's between. Mm -hmm. And for 3D information, you can take internal coordinates, Z matrices, and if you go for electron density, you probably will stay with a voxel grid. Mm -hmm. So there's, I think, it's probably also like a 40 years research on developing the best representation for, for molecules. And there is something that you can do. You can take the good old day binary descriptor that's just like code for the presence of the function, functional element in a, in a molecule or not. Then like 1D, 2D topological descriptors that describe certain fragments in this molecule by a random walk. Um, as circular fingerprints, which are still, um, we have heard it before, the extended connectivity fingerprints are uh, probably used in many, many, many um, QSA models or 3D descriptors. And when I started doing this kind of machine learning stuff, I thought, yeah, now we have this crazy algorithm and we are just put new architectures and we don't change the input. And the, um, the results was a little bit like frustrating because the, the improvement, performance improvement was really marginal. So it was almost no getting a big improvement, no matter what kind of, you put it like a, a deep neural network with three layers and to regularize it with dropout or whatever it on it, um, the input was the important. Mm -hmm. So um, all those um, models, they are basically exploiting the same principles at a certain point. So a good descriptor should describe a molecule in the chemical space in such a nice way that molecules that are chemically very close to each other most likely maybe also share something with respect to their activity. Mm -hmm. So that was the reason for us why we then changed and come up with a new descriptor. That's what people have heard now all the time here is like these kind of pre-trained or learned embeddings. So we, have, we were one of the first that had developed um, an embedding that works directly on the smiles by encoding the smiles into a Latin space and decode it again to the, trans, um, to the canonical form. So the only thing that we did different there was like we used it in the term of a neural translation. So we were not, trans, uh, we were not um, decoding it to the same molecule and the same representation, the smiles representation. So that's what you would do it with a self-supervised learning. We translated it to, to an equivalent or equivalent representation, that's a canonical form. That means you can have one smiles, but you can only have one canonical smiles. And this canonical smiles is derived through certain rules. So the network therefore had to learn also the grammar and the syntax of, this, of, the, of the smiles representation. That was a very nice boost because that gave us a very information rich representation that is not just like rememorizing certain characters in the smile string. It has to learn something about the meaning of an opening bracket and a closing bracket. Mm -hmm. So on the other hand, we wanted to have also an embedding that is smooth. That means if you decode it and you are not exactly have a point in this Latin space that you want to go, you wanted to code more like a manifold and that would read to the same, uh, to the same canonical smile then. Mm -hmm. So that is work that we have published at Chemical Science and um, that was probably uh, one of those kind of works that was giving us a lot of success because with that kind of work we received lots of credit in the community. Mm -hmm. So um, again, a good descriptor, you, why is this translation here? You see here if you would do the translation between the canonical smiles to the canonical smiles, then you have a very high translation accuracy during the training of those networks because it's a very simple task. People can, uh, network can learn this very nicely. But if you then take this kind of um, um, embedding for predicting a certain downstream task like lipophobicity, for example, uh, for a regression task or, or aims for a classification task, then you see that the, the, the embedding is not well suited. It does not have enough information. It's just like memorizing the positions of atoms in the string. Mm -hmm. So therefore, 
by making it more complicated. So translating, for example, from an Inchi key to smiles, the task becoming much more complicated. You see immediately that the performance is increased. But um, Inchi keys coming with certain property uh, um, problems, it's not so easy to do it. So therefore, we decided to go from a smiles to a canonical smiles. And therefore, that was a very good trade-off. So we could translate that better as an Inchi key. But on the other hand, we also received very, very nice predictive performance. We have also evaluated this on AIMS, HERC, mutagesony, blood brain barrier penetration, and so on, uh, in a very hard cluster cross, one hour, uh, cross um, validation setup. And it's always like, it's, it's not any longer that you have to optimize. So do I fold my molecule with 1,224 bit to I take three um, atoms radius? So it was not any longer necessary. You can just take it, and it works um, quite nicely out of the box. Um, so. What we have done then, when we use this kind of molecular representation for lots of downstream tasks. So we used it for training networks that allows us to do optical chemical character recognition. A um, very important task if you have a paper and you want to extract the chemical structure that is depicted in the paper and you want to check do we have the same structure maybe in stock when you have to, to do um, some kind of um, uh, pattern matching there or um, an image matching. Um, we did it for structure elucidation. It's for uh, analytics where you have an MNR spectrum and you want to identify what is the chemical structure that was actually analyzed there. We use it for bioactivity prediction, also for guiding our de novo design process towards that we have some kind of scoring function, or of course also for route planning. Mm -hmm. All very, and these are all projects we are working and all those models that we have there, all the source code is publicly available. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to the root planning to a little bit model that we are doing on the reaction modeling. So the rational there is it like that, oops, back. Mm -hmm. Okay, the rational there is it like um, computer synthesis, um, assistant synthesis planning is basically a very important tool for the novo drug design because we want to make sure that if, if we come up with a new drug that this drug can be also synthesized. Mm -hmm. So and um, that is, um, the part there is it actually, so any part of this reaction template can be predicted, so any missing part. You can have a, like a forward prediction if you take our product models it called. If you take the, the reactants and the reagent, then you can predict the product. If you take the product and the reagent and doing a backward prediction, then it's a retrosis, so retrosynthesis single step prediction. Or you can take the reaction and the products and predict the reagents. That is very often used in order to optimize the chemical um, re um, reagent that becomes, that you increase the yield. Um, that is well observed, observed. So Marvin, uh, Marvin Ziegler worked on this kind of field, or Philip Schwaller has developed models about it. The molecular transformer for that kind of purpose is a weapon of choice. People are using it, and it's nothing to improve there. But um, we wanted to, uh, to use this in the context of reagent prediction because um, our previous work in this field was really always like only optimizing a single type or a few type of reaction. But we wanted to use it for to predicting reagent for any kind of reactions that you type that you can have or identify in US patent office data set. So, and the reason also is it like if you want to use it afterwards in this CAS planning tool, then the CAS planning tools are not providing any prediction about the reagent, what kind of reagent to use to conduct the, um, the chemical reaction, the route. And there's also lots of flaws in the US patent offices because the data is not properly annotated. There are lots of missing reagents in there mm -hmm. and, and false one. Um, so these are kind of examples where you see like, for example, a reaction template where all reagents are specified. Here you see that the solvent is missing, here is the catalyst is missing, and there you see also that they're all reagents are missing. So the problem there is that this is a training data set for almost all reaction prediction tools, product reaction tools out there. So a couple of people working with pistachio that is a little bit better annotated for NextMove or from Reaxis, but that's for open source um, products, it is, this is the basis. Mm -hmm. So the idea was it like, can we just take US patent office data, train a reagent model, then update in US patent office with this reagent model all missing the reactions, then improve a production model and then see how the production model gets increased in uh, increased performance. Very simple, straightforward work. 
Um, Michael from PhD student funded from the European Union worked on this topic in my group and um, he did a very nice job there. So first of all, we could successfully apply this model that can do this prediction for all kinds of chemical reaction types. It has a roughly 70% one top one partial match accuracy. That is for reagent prediction very good. Mm -hmm. So after the annotations of the reactions, we roughly have changed 25% of all, percent of all reagents in, in US patent office. Then um, it showed us also that you can increase so that you can restore catalyzed and that you can remove certain agents. And overall then um, in the work published then in chemical science, also Mikael could show that if you then update the production model, that you can achieve a very significant improvement with a top month match accuracy roughly going to the 90%. That was a um, very nice um, outcome from this first paper. And that was also the first paper that was coming out from my group at Pfizer during that time. No. Um, so the other problem is that like all the kind of representations that I've showed you, these are like 2D representations. Or so, but we all know that molecules actually live in the 3D space world. So, um, so Julian, also a PhD student from my group, Therefore, thought about in the context of toxicity prediction, um, we should build a model that works in the 3D space, so graph, uh, graph attention networks. Um, and this is a really important because classical 2D descriptor that are just describing the topology of the, of the, of the molecules, they, then are, they cannot cope with stereochemistry, for example. And as you can hear it here, for example, that is um, the cisplatin, which is a well-known chemoterapeuticum, while um, the transplatin is not showing any effect, or the s dalatumide is embryotoxic, while the other one is um, a well-known tranquilizer from the 60s. Hmm. So um, we even had for this particular purpose developed um, a variant from, it's called um, MD Torch from, and from, Gianni, from Gianni De Fabrizio, that is his academic co-supervisor, um, extended it towards that um, he can apply it for, um, um, for, um, for toxicity prediction by including force field information as an additional feature to each atom, and then has developed an equivalent transformer network. The equivalent transformer network is taking into account that the label of the molecule should not change dependent of the translation or the rotation of the molecule. So if it's toxic, it should be, it should, it's, it's independent of that. So it takes care of that, that we can, um, that this kind of um, um, equivariant is fulfilled. It's, um, the pod pod is, it's a message parsing protocol where you get certain, um, within a certain um, diameter of a central atom, certain messages of atoms that are connected over the graph or the horn cloud uh, describing the graph there. You have certain features that are then parameterized by a neural network and that are exchanged and aggregated and then they are aggregated and afterwards in this kind of gated neural network where they have this equivariant block where all the um, translational and rotational um, vector features of, um, are then um, collapsed or um, aggregated to a scalar which can become um, independent to rotation and translation. Mm -hmm. Then afterwards this kind of um, uh, um, aggregated features are then just forwarded to a feed-forward network that is then doing the prediction of something is toxic or not. Mm -hmm. um, so um, he did also a very deep comparison to existing methods or so SMILES transformer on multiple different kinds of data set, TOX21, TOX20, and TOXCast and so on. And you can see that it's a very clear improvement um, including LNG um, function does not have a big deal, so it does not really increase the predicted performance of the models. But for all the other kinds, it's clearly outperforms SMILES transformer by a large margin. Um, something that is quite notable is that the predictive performance of this blood-brain barrier penetration, which is like for um, for computation for neuroscience drugs, um, quite important, um, is extremely good. Mm -hmm. So the work was also published in Chemical Research and Toxicology, was picked by the ACS as um, um, editor's choice, and um, so it's all publicly available models also for that. Mm -hmm. So um, I will not say that this is something that explains what, why the model is saying that this is toxic or not. Um, we all know that attention scores are not explaining, 
Um, but there is also other papers that are saying attention scores are not not explaining, so there is an ongoing debate something. So nonetheless, it gives an, um, a chemist maybe insight why something, why the model is particular um, um, saying that something has a toxic artifact. So what you can see here, so the attention scores are then the deriving um, functional elements of the molecule, while um, the kind of um, edges between those one are describing the strengths of the attention scores. Um, so we have not discussed it so far with medicinal sinus, but I'm very happy to do that. Even so, I would probably not be very, uh, I cannot very much contribute. I'm just computer scientist. Mm -hmm. So, but nonetheless, we have um, in the diversity of data and the drug discovery universe is super, super high. So we can work on, on those peaks, we can on histopathological data, single cell sequencing data, whatever it is. So, so we should make use of all the data to inform our processes a little bit better. Mm -hmm. So that is the next topic, so why we are suggesting to learning from phenotypic screens. You see here that is a data from the JUMPCP, um, Joint Undertake for Morphological Profiling Cell Painting. That is a large cross, um, a large um, um, project led by Ann Carpenter here from the board and 10 pharmaceutical partners that were donating drugs um, and um, uh, compounds to test them and also generating the, the data. You can see here, that if you build up the millimeter and spanning tree across those phenotypic um, uh, um, images, then you see that certain, that there are clear um, certain patterns inside that are then, for example, showing the way how a compound is changing from DMSO to a certain mode of action. And that was some kind of work that we have done a while ago. So um, that was then bringing us to the point where we wanted to understand, can we explore that in a more systematic way? There's a lot of this kind of data there. There have you have like a chemical or a genetic perturbation induced in the cell, and then you want to test the readout if this is inducing like a, a bioactivity in form of a, in a proliferation assay, um, as a high content image, and so there's lots of data there. So the problem with this kind of data is it if you cluster the chemical perturbation, for example, in the chemical space by doing Tanimoto similarity on the ECFP and then apply some kind of UMAP on it, then you see that some kind of compost, uh, past, um, um, compounds that show a clear activity hmm, cluster together in the chemical space very nicely. But in the biological space, they are completely spread over. So there is something there that you cannot really link those kind of two spaces very well. So, Therefore, we tried to do another way. We wanted to use those kind of information from the cell painting assay and train something in a different way. So typically, um, that is a classical pipeline, also developed here at the board by Ann Carpenter. You have this kind of high content imaging screens here, the readouts of the microscopes, you do the image analysis by segmentating certain cells, then um, calculate some kind of properties, and that gives you the cell profiler features. Um, those cell polar features are then very often used as embedding for, um, to describe um, how, how, the gen, how the genetic or the chemical perturbation is um, perturbating um, the morphological shape of the cell. Mm -hmm. So what we wanted to do, um, I actually, and those kind of features then are very often then are used in some kind of a downstream task to predict the mode of action. Um, what we wanted to do, we wanted to replace this kind of cell profiler pipeline and directly learn this end-to-end -end from the beginning. So the, what be the, the assumption by was that like, first of all, we wanted to check if there are the morphological features allowed us to derive more about those mode of action of a perturbation. And we also wanted to learn this in a more unsupervised and an, an unbiased way because um, it's, it's great features, but there were human invented and humans have certain assumption and we wanted to move it to develop something that is going um, in a less unbiased way. Yeah. So um, Dan from my group did this, he also benchmarked it, so we have now trained everything end to end. And then afterwards we checked, so what is the Latin class assignment? If you take a mode of action of a compound, um, of, a, of the cell painting image and see how closely is this, this image in this Latin space to its next neighbors. Hmm? For um, um, the, and what we can see here for the Latin class assignment, the mode of action profiler that the two, uh, the two was called can do that in a much better or nicer way than existing tools. That is also work that we have then published at uh, in Digital Discovery. And um, the point there was 
we wanted to use it actually as a proof of principle to see if there is information in the morphological profiles that we can use to inform a generative process to generate chemistry. Hmm? So and that is a little bit the pipeline that we have. So you can here take a molecule, a starting molecule, you encode it into a Latin space that gives you an encoded scaffold. And now you want to take a generator network and that can be a diffusion process, something like going with a conditional stable diffusion, for example, or it can be like what people have used before and like a generated adversarial network. But you can condition this on chemical perturbations. And those chemical perturbations can either come from a morphological, from a cell painting screen, high content imaging screen, or they can come from a transcriptomic screen. We have tried out both things. So the next step is that you train this, this kind of the loop all the whole time. And then afterwards, you get an optimized scaffold that you can decode again. Because you remember, we have this encoder decoder architecture in the beginning. So everything that is in this Latin space can be decoded to a molecule again. And that gives us then a new scaffold that is optimized with respect to certain um, properties. In this case, we believe that um, it is more likely that this improved compound or scaffold would induce a desired phenotypic response in the cell. So um, we have published this in Nature Communication with respect to uh, um, using transcriptomic data. But after we have published it, we realized that this will not scale just due to the costs. And therefore, we wanted to try that out also on um, using cell painting data that worked also very nicely. And that has been also published in um, the Digital Discovery. So that's now the beauty, is it now, what we can do. Now we have trained everything in this chemical space with chemical perturbation, but there is now also the data from high content imaging streams or from, from transcriptomic data with genetic perturbations. Mm -hmm. And now we can take the generator network, take an imaging, um, high content imaging um, morphological profile that coming from the genetic perturbation and trying to induce and decode it to a new chemical scaffold that is likely to induce the same morphological phenotype that is actually coming from this genetic perturbation. And that's what we've done here, what we have done here. We showed here and we benchmarked this against an existing scaffold and we see that this kind of like, since it's a um, it's CRISPR overexpression that goes on, so therefore we see, uh, we benchmarked that against how likely can we identify a known agonist for, for this kind of perturbation. And these were the compounds that were generated. None of those scaffolds were part of the training. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's super highly significant. So that's, um, we can at least from, from this kind of fingerprint, we can generate a compound or a scaffold that is likely to introduce also the same morphological fingerprint. We did it also for NF kappa beta 1. And there the results were also quite um, good. Mm -hmm. um, so, but what we can do then next, huh? So now we can take also um, an embedding profile in this five minutes, perfect, done. Uh, one more slide. Huh? <laughs> uh, uh, then um, we can also take um, now um, uh, um, embedding um, from the DMSO and, and do a linter interpolation to go to a certain profile like breast can, um, like NF kappa beta one by keeping always a molecular embedding as a starting condition. Mm -hmm. And that's what I have done here. And we have shown here, so for example, going to NF kappa beta 1, so it's Euclidean distant to DMSO, so we can make a compound that is much more likely to be an active to or um, similar, um, for, according to the critic network, um, to showing activity on NF kappa beta 1, then if you would go into a random direction in this Latin space, so you can do the interpolation into a a random direction, or you can maybe see the interpolation into the most 10 component um, and principal components. And that's what we have done here. So we can now use this kind of networks to navigate also on those phenotypic screening space. And that's something that is quite cool. I'm very much looking forward to uh, investigate this in more detail. Mm -hmm. So with that, uh, five minutes for, for a question I have. So conclusion, um, yeah, and the role and applications of molecular representation and drug discovery. I, I discussed this a little bit, also showed you some kind of nice example for using this for, for building reaction models. Mm -hmm. So I also um, showed you some results how we can develop um, a graph attention networks that takes 3D information into account to predict toxicity, outperforms existing models by a large margin. Mm -hmm. We also 
could control you that you can predict reliable the mode of action of a, um, of a compound only from its morphological fingerprints. And also we introduced this concept of generate FFI condition on biological constraints. Mm -hmm. so with that, uh, I have to uh, give a shout out, a big thank you to uh, my former team at Bayer, uh, to my uh, new team at Pfizer, um, also to those great colleagues that I have at Bayer, and also um, acknowledge um, the funding from the European Union, my PhD students, and my academic collaborators. And with that, I'm happy to take your questions. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. If there's any questions, please come up to the microphone. Thank you for a great talk. So how about the embedding modules for quantum chemistry and the molecular dynamics into machine learning algorithm for property prediction? I didn't get the question, sorry. Uh, embedding quantum chemistry or molecular dynamics. Yes, we don't, we don't reflect that. Uh, yeah. It's not so, so all the embeddings that I've shown, these are like bedding completely only relying on the topological of the string, of the smile string. So we don't integrate any, uh, any information of the quantum mechanics of the compound. Don't, it's not done. Hmm? Does it answer? Okay, thanks. Hmm? Ah. Hey, nice talk. Thanks, Fred. Uh, I had a question on the, the 3D aspect. So yeah. I understand how you can use this equivariant representation to come up with something that's translationally and rotationally invariant, but how do you handle conformational flexibility in that? Uh, uh, you're, you're as a chemist. I, I cannot answer. <laughs> uh, so uh, well, I'm a computer scientist. Yeah. No, uh, so. <laughs> Mole molecules, molecules have multiple conformations. Yeah. How does that get integrated in there? Yeah. Okay, I can tell you a few things what we are doing, okay? So molecules have multiple, you can randomly sample a set of conformations. And then you can also try to fit an ensemble of conformations into the network to predict the downstream task. Right, but that's not what our machine learning models are set up to do, right? Machine learning models are set up to take a single instance and relate it to a single label. Oh, why not? Uh, we, you, we, we, you can. But train. we don't. I mean, uh, we have multiple instance machine learning models that are just not well up. developed yeah. at this point. Yeah, but we do it. You know, you can you can take an ensemble of inputs that for a compound and then predict like bioactivity, and you will see that there are some conformations in the molecule are more likely to introduce this kind of bioactivity. If you learn that there's an attention block of it, the network should figure out which are the conformations that are more likely to showing bioactivity or not. Okay, well, I'm going to try out your lovingly created code. So. Okay. Yeah. yeah, do it. Do it. Uh, and the, the last one is not publicly available. That is something in pipeline. Okay. Uh, so with respect to the conformation and multi and attention box. Hmm? Thanks. Okay, okay uh, one question on the Zoom. Um, for molecular representation, smiles is the standard approach, but there are others like selfies. And then um, um, how do you, have you explored other approaches or representations like that? Um, so for this molecular representation smiles that is work that is really like three or four years old. So the topic is dead for us. We don't, we will not revisit this. So it's like, um, we have tied at that time, we have benchmarked lots of different kinds of things that was out there. We have also taken the, the comparison like from Gomez Bomarelli, um, it's kind of variation ordering for the stuff there, but it's, it's not uh, relevant anymore. Right? Hmm? Uh, so talk about different representations of molecules. Like I have a question. Like it seems to me like for a given molecule, there's a one-to-one -one mapping from the 1D smiles to the 2D graphs and then to 3D coordinates. Maybe maybe a group of them because considering the conformation of flexibility. But it seems to me they are one-to-one -one mapping. Is it possible? Like given the smiles, you can learn the other representations from the smiles using a. Yeah. I think it's not possible to um, to do a one-by-one one mapping from the from the smiles to the um, 3D conformation of the molecule. It's um, you. It's it's not there, hmm? right? Hmm? Uh, right. Like for yeah. example, given a molecule like a benzene ring, and then you you kind of can can by by different calculations or several characterizations, you know, like there is a stable conformation on that, or several of them. <laughs> That is um, a, a very, very computational informatic um, question. I'm, I'm not computationally convinced. I really cannot tell you. That is like, um, I would love to, but it's not my topic. I, I, we never worked on this kind of field. Huh? So from smiles to um, 3D coordinates, that is something 
uh, maybe it's possible. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, can, can maybe, Pat, can you help out? Huh? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, we don't know. We can. I mean, you can. We can. We can for a given smiles. We can sample arbitrary confirmation. There are a lot of things that would do. But um, what is the right one? We don't know. There are some confirmations that are maybe like more energetically for more favorable. Um, but that is going into the quantum mechanic properties where I also don't feel that I'm the right person to. Uh, to uh, have this kind of discussion. Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. So, uh, hi. Uh, hi, I'm Andrew. Hi. Um, so, I'm, my talk is going to be the exact opposite of yours. I'm really looking okay. forward to this. I'm looking forward. Yes. Uh. <laughs> so, I, I want to give you a chance to respond. So, my, my question is that, um, you know, we, we talk about whether we want to represent a molecule with 3D structure, with conformations, with electron density, with wave function, right? Yeah. Like, it has to stop somewhere, right? Uh, so, I. My talk, one of my hypotheses is that we should draw the line on what we can actually control. So you can't build you know, a molecule with a different conformational ensemble than what it has at you know, the temperature you're at. Or you can't really, you know, um, if you can't edit the stereochemistry, there's no need to represent the stereochemistry, especially if it's global stereochemistry or unusual stereochemistry. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's a, a reasonable way to draw the molecular representation? Or do you believe that there is some sort of fundamental you know, representation that we need to get at with our models that is the the ground truth. So um, that is a question that I have no answer for this kind of question. I, it's like, um, what is the fundamental representation of the molecule? So I, we will. I think that is. I, I'm very much excited to see how you address this and what's your view on that is. <laughs> uh, and then I will ask you the, maybe a question afterwards. Okay. Uh, uh, Okay. Maybe we can have a, um, a, a little debate at the end there. Anyway, thank you so much. Please. Yeah. Um, thank you.